Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, please, uh, you can take your seat uh, and welcome to the Italian Pavilion. The entire world, as you know, um, comes together here in Dubai uh, for the World Exposition. The first to take place in the Arab world, the first in terms of numbers of countries that decides to participate, more than 190 countries, all united by an inspiring claim, connecting minds, creating the future. Um, in this place, in our own amphitheater, a place we have dedicated to knowledge and learning, we represent actually this claim every single day. And today, we are decided to embody this message by going through the universe uh, of tourism. I'm Lorenzo Micheli, and on behalf of the entire Italian pavilion, it is uh, our honor to officially welcome to all the authorities, national and international guests, uh, to the new frontiers of sustainable tourism, uh, an international forum promoted directly by the Italian Pavilion. Uh, in the run-up uh, to the travel and uh, connectivity week of Expo, we have invited uh, some of the most important players uh, across the UAE, Italy, and the world to join together and on the opportunities and way to shape a future in uh, which the world traveling, um, a world that we like better than tourism, can live in a consistent way with the landscape. And when we mention landscape today, we would include nature, arts, people, tradition, but also on how to bring local and national policy makers closer to the potential of international cooperation. But also uh, how to stress an horizontal approach in the tourism sector. Not only this week, um, in which uh, the uh, issue of tourism will be central, but tourism uh, is and has been everywhere during this Expo 2020. We now talk about health tourism, now more than ever, a specific topic uh, we will deal with in the upcoming health and wellness thematic week. But we also discuss on rural tourism. We discussed last October, which is more and more important, connected to our attention to the discover of uh, sustainable agriculture and sport tourism too. The world uh, is moving to watching with the discuss on the Italian Sport Day last November. And there is no better place to do so than the Italian Pavilion that I invite to visit you all considering um, it is shaped around the idea of discovery and exploration with 15 Italian regions that sign their official participation at the Expo and that are at the core of our exhibition as well as uh, at the core of our programming of events. Yesterday was just the regional day of Sicily with uh, an immersive installation that you can still visit in the Academia, just next to this place. And tomorrow again, another appointment with the Lazio region about the luxury tourism. And all this privilege has not been limited to the people of this room. Starting from the 1st of October, our forums, dialogues, co-creation, conference forums have already reached more than 7 million users on our social media channels. We had more 300,000 social interaction with social posts and today, actually, we are currently live and watched by other pavilions, by other institutions, by other universities, which is why we would like to greet all those who are watching us from home. So with this connection, with these pictures in mind, let me now leave the floor to the General Commissioner of the Italian Pavilion, Paolo Glisenti. Good afternoon, everybody. I just want to welcome you, and especially I want to thank you, thank the Minister of Tourism, Garavaglia, who has given us the honor and the pleasure, the privilege of having him here today in this key event of the Travel and Connectivity Week, including I want to thank the Sicilian region with the Vice President, the Lazio region with his Director General, 
and everybody else here, the Emirates uh, friends uh, from uh, DP World and other, and the president of ENIT uh, who has given us the pleasure of being here. So thank you very, everybody for being here and take this discussion. I just want to remind what, what I usually say at this point of uh, the beginning of the discussion. Dubai is at the center of uh, a world uh, which is uh, key for the future of tourism. We are five hours radio uh, in, a, in a zone where three billion people live, almost half of the world population, of an average age of uh, 29, 30 years old. This will be the part of the world that will generate uh, uh, the most important uh, uh, flow of tourism in the next uh, few years. And the young people visiting Expo are geared, interested in understanding, linked to experiencing tourism, uh, health tourism, uh, academic tourism. We have a lot of students that uh, are deciding now where to go and uh, attend universities in the future, also with attention to the landscaping, the, the, the way of living, the sustainability uh, of uh, uh, countries and places like Italy wants to present. So I want to just to share to you, with you the importance of having this discussion in Expo today. Uh, sustainability is a key element of Expo, but I think uh, it's going to be uh, a key element of your discussion on tourism, because this part of the world, the 3 billion people average age of 29, 30 years old, uh, attach a fundamental importance to sustainability of the way of life, including tourism. And it's not only land, the, the environmental sustainability, but it's the social sustainability, the cultural sustainability, the economic sustainability. So I think this is a very important discussion and I really look forward to hearing your talks. We have been working for the last uh, couple of years on data provided us, estimates provided us by the Politecnico di Milano, estimating that uh, uh, Italy attracts, uh, attracts uh, about 2%, less than 2% of uh, the tourists uh, uh, coming from this large, wide area of the world. But only uh, increasing by 5% annually after Expo, using Expo as a leverage for increasing tourism by 5% will create a, a very significant increase of flow of tourism by in the range of 30,000 people per year, 25 million euros plus of more income from Italy, for Italian tourism. So I think that we are at the verge of a very important crossroad for the future of tourism in Italy, in Europe, and in the Mediterranean at large. So thank you very much again for coming, and I really hope you have a great time with us. Please visit the pavilion and see how much tourism attraction there is installed in this pavilion for you to appreciate and talk about. Thank you again. Thank you, Commissioner, for, for this message and on the wave of the number that we have been mentioned on the importance day that we celebrate today. Uh, I'm more than pleased to leave the stage to the Italian Minister for Tourism, Massimo Garavaglia. Good evening. First of all, I would like to thank uh, the Italian Pavilion for organizing this forum and for giving us the opportunity to share ideas and experiences on the prospect for the tourism sector in such a beautiful and exciting venue. I would also thank the tourism authorities from the United Arab Emirates and the representative from Italian regions for joining us. As the second year marked by the COVID pandemic is closing, the tourism sector is facing two main challenges. The most urgent, of course, is restoring confidence among travelers to restart tourism. Experience has shown us uh, that vaccination and 
uh, standardized certificates and safety protocols are key elements in this respect. Let me say something about this. From, a, from an economic point of view, the pandemic has triggered formulas in social behavior that are very similar to self-fulfilling pro prof prophecies. No one denies the presence of the virus, but even effective safety protocols are put in place, there is no need for tourists to renounce their experience. Just to transfer one example, the protection system we implemented in Italy makes it possible to ski even in the, in the, if in the chosen mountain resorts are in the orange zone. We must return to a normal life with and despite of COVID. In the past, I have compared the presence of the virus to the effect produced by a safety car when it, when it enters a Grand Prix. And, and this phenomenon brings us to the second and no less important challenge, transforming the tourism industry, making it more sustainable as far as the, as the environment, the local societies and cultures are concerned, and more fit to the new trends and demons that were highlighted by the pandemics. It is a transition that must start now and will have long lasting effect. These challenges were at the core of the Italy's action as the G20 presidency in 2021. Let me remind the Rome guidelines for the future of tourism that were endorsed by the G20 ministers and the UN WTO recommendation for a transition to a green travel and tourism economy. The transition to a sustainable and digital future for tourism is a, is a priority in the domestic and the EU agenda. Sustainable tourism will also be in the spotlight in the UNWTO Global Youth Tourism Forum we will be hosting in Sorrento in June. It will be an excellent occasion for sharing fresh and innovative ideas and view for the future of sustainable tourism directly from the generation that will shape the tourism of tomorrow. Tourists are increasingly looking for sustainable experiences and destinations. The pandemic matched with a growing environment awareness and attention on physical and mental well-being and he answered a desire for a closer and balanced contact with nature, for attending human connection, for a diversified and personalized experiences. Green business models and environmental practices are increasing an integral part of the tourist offer. Italy has a huge potential for meeting these emerging trends. My country offers a unique combination of natural attractions, a rich, thought, not yet fully appreciated cultural heritage, extra, extraordinary no, uh, eno gastronomy, as well opportunities for sport practices and training. Such multidimensional offer can be complemented and enriched by digital experience before, during, and after the stay. The Ministry of Tourism in the framework of overall national recovery and resilience plan, is working on making the Italian tourism offer, starting from the physical infrastructure and of the hotel industry, increasingly, increasingly sustainable and ready to meet the change demand together with the Italian Tourist Board, LENIT, aims and strengthening and targeting promotion, including through digital platforms. Many of today's speakers can illustrate specific initiatives and ideas, but I would like to draw your attention to a project we have developed together with the Italian Railways Foundation and other actors aimed at promoting the discovery of, of some less known tourism routes in different regions traveling by historic trains. This is just an example of how it is possible to develop an integrated approach combining sustainable transportation with the, promotional, the promotion of all local culture or food in a slow and all-round tourist experience. The pandemic forces us to stop and think of the future and at the same time stimulate a growing public and political awareness and the role of and com a contribution of tourism for our economies and our societies. 
This is the right moment to realize that there cannot be a sustainable recovery without a sustainable tourism. I wish every success to this forum and to our joint efforts to restart and rethink tourism. Thank you. Thank you to the Italian Minister for Tourism. Uh, and now I've been already introduced. Uh, it's time uh, uh, to put uh, at the center of the conversation the three components that we chose today. Sustainable and safe travel, digital experience, and experiential and slow journey. And uh, I'm really happy because uh, to introduce them and their voices, the voices of all speakers today, there will be two of our child youth voices, uh, the volunteers, the mentors of the Italian pavilion, Giovanni and Giorgia. Giovanni will first tell us uh, a landing story and launch uh, his personal experience of traveling sustainable and slow, and Giorgia uh, will drive through the entire journeys of the three panel session. So please give them to a good round of applause, Giorgia and Giovanni. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Giovanni Moro. I'm a peer mentor at the Commissariat here at the Pavilion. When I was 16 years old, Ultimate Airport Dubai was my favorite National Geographic documentary because it went beyond the, sh the scenes at Dubai Airport to follow some of the 90,000 employees responsible for over 70 million passengers traveling through Dubai every year. I really enjoyed the documentary because it showed that even events happening thousands of miles away do have an impact on the transportation system every day. Ultimate Airport Dubai also revealed that the disruptive impetus of technology can facilitate journeys uh, for both travelers and workers. And while technology has not lost its innovative potential and it's more and more needed in the present circumstances, much has changed since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. With most fleets grounded, hotels closed, and travel restrictions being implemented, Travel and tourism have become some of the most affected sectors since the COVID-19 pandemic began to spread. Against this background, it was this summer that I discovered a silver lining of the pandemic. Embarking on a five-month trip to Polynesia allowed me to meet many people from different islands to appreciate the time that I was spending with them while working with friends committed to protecting endangered bird species. I realized that taking time to experience their culture, feeling the nature, is the best way to discover the true essence of a destination. Whether it's dining with a local fisherman, or observing birds all together with the binocular, or dancing with the locals at their culture festival, or again learning to surf from someone who grew up riding those waves, it's these human-to-human -human interactions that make our trip so meaningful and so unforgettable. In this land that has inspired many travelers and artists, such as Paul Gauguin, I was able to experience a form of slow tourism that enable me to better understand where do I come from, what I am, and where I'm going. In light of the pandemic, we must necessarily rethink the way, we, uh, the way tourism makes uh, us interact with our communities, the way we can adapt technology to our needs, the way we can reconcile fair economic activities with our natural resources and ecosystems. This is the reason why, during today's conference, we seek to cast some light on the new frontiers of sustainable tourism as part of Expo 2020 Travel and Connectivity Week. The journey to making tourism more innovative, safer, experiential, qualitative, inclusive, more sustainable, does indeed encompass institutions, business actors, research centers, and associations. And you are all gathered here today under these three halls. And I would like to ask you, how can your synergy make us witnesses of the beauty that connects people? The world should now go to Georgia, a fellow peer mentor, who will be also the moderator of this conference. Georgia, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Giovanni. Thank you for, for your introduction, but also 
thank you for sharing your personal story, which will be the key to uh, start our journey through these uh, three panels that today uh, will enrich our, our afternoon here in this wonderful frame of the Italian amphitheater here at um, the Italian Pavilion at Expo Dubai. So that said, let me go straight to our first panel and uh, let me move on and uh, introduce our um, uh, the true the true protagonists of uh, of the forum of today. Uh, I have the honor of calling them here physically in this uh, both real and digital arena, uh, which is the this wonderful amphitheater. So let me introduce you um, Giorgio Palmucci, which is uh, the president of ENIT, the Italian Government uh, Tourist Board. Thank you very much, Mr. Palmucci, for being here. And our second guest will be um, Amza Mustafa, uh, the COO and P&O Marinas, the Peninsular and Oriental Steam Navigation Company from Dippy World. Thank you very much for being here. And we also have Alessandra Priante, the director of the regional department of Europe at the World Tourism Organization, who is uh, connected with us virtually um, here with us. Thank you. Thank and you Armando Brunini, uh, chief executive officer and managing director of the Milan Airports Management Company, SEA. Uh, the group which is responsible both for um, Milan Malpensa and um, Milan Linate airports. Thank you. Good afternoon, Dubai. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to you too. And last but not least, we have Rossella Carrara, the Vice President of Corporate Relations and Sustainability of Costa Crociere. Thank you. Um, thank you for good. being here. Good thank afternoon and good afternoon to all of you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you to all of you for being here and to contribute to this, let's say, worldwide debate that is taking place here, not only at the Italian Pavilion, but at Expo 2020 Dubai. And it's time for our question time to start all together. So my first question uh, will get to um, Mrs. Priante, uh, who, as I said, she's currently working at the um, United Nations World Tourism Organization, uh, which represents, um, as you probably know, the worldwide organization promoting uh, tourism uh, as a driver of, um, of economic growth, uh, development, and environmental sustainability. Uh, the UN has uh, recently uh, launched a project and their committed transition to the uh, net zero before 2050 that, of course, will only be possible um, if we accelerate the tourism recovery uh, and the adoption of, um, let's say, sustainable consumption and production. Um, Mrs. Priante, how, in your opinion, the international community can collaborate, uh, let's say, in uh, shape, is shaping the future of tourism, focusing especially on the emergencies that we are, uh, that the, the current scenario is actually, um, uh, is actually happening now, and what are the challenges? First of all, Georgia, allow me once again to greet all of you. It's a real pity I couldn't be in Dubai with you. Dubai has been my home for five years in uh, great years. So I, I really would like to, to give a big greetings to not only the city of Dubai, but to the UAE as a whole, who uh, last year celebrated their 50th anniversary. So assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh to all of you. And uh, you're very lucky now to be there in this fantastic city. Um, we are in trouble, Georgia. That's what uh, we are, really. And I would like to uh, particularly uh, thank uh, Paolo Glizenti and uh, the Expo Dubai for the invitation. But mostly, I would like to uh, remark the words of the minister, Garavaglia, who with great wisdom has, gave, has given a quite of an intense uh, picture, but I would like to, uh, before thinking about what we can do and the, the ways that we can work together, because obviously one thing that we've been advocating from the beginning is that we have to come out of this together. And we haven't really seen that. We have to be very honest. We've seen a, a real tendency, which is understand it, understandable, definitely, because health is a priority at national level, but we've seen a tendency 
of governments to go by themselves and sometimes even you know not really caring about doing something with the neighbors rather you know a little bit against the neighbors sort of saying okay the the cake has got smaller so let's try to not lose any let's see a uh, part of the slices that we have but to give you an idea of the numbers that we have forecasted that this year is going to be the year where probably the social costs of this pandemic are going to be there the most in terms of job loss in terms of death rate of small and medium enterprises uh we would like to give you a very fresh overview of this is an absolute premiere that i'm giving to you and dubai these are our newest data updated on 31st december 2021 and this gives you the picture of the loss of international tourism arrivals we've all been very clear that we've lost a lot nevertheless we also wanted to show that 2020 we recuperated because the minus was just 20% when compared to 2020 but we're still very close to 80% when compared to 2019 so we're still incredibly far from the levels that we reached in 2019 nevertheless we have to be very sure about one thing and we've always said this in every situation do we want to go back to these numbers is that sustainable you very correctly pointed out our new strategy of carbon neutrality by 2050 something that we at UNWTO are taking very dear to heart because we're now shaping a new fund for the the climate neutrality in tourism especially through the leverage of sustainability which is our main driver our main goal but we have to ask ourselves are these numbers something that we need to go back to definitely we need to increase the turnover definitely we need to give companies hotels hospitality uh airlines cruise operators railways and anybody that is related somehow with tourism a breath of fresh air and this breath of fresh air is not there yet so we have to really be aware that we're facing a crisis which we have never seen and we have never expected therefore georgia we were not prepared and definitely as uh, minister said in one of his recent interviews and i was very pleased to hear it uh in uh, we are much more prepared now than we were in the beginning so one of the things that we definitely need to change all of us together is the way that we communicate because if we continue communicating in a situation where uh, things are being held as dramatic as possible and people are being fear uh, we're living with fear and staying at home rather than going on vacation or canceling everything we are definitely not going anywhere so we need to make sure that we have the numbers right especially for us to be able to design the right policies to recover and so we need to ask ourselves good questions and as at UNWTO we try to provide the governments and the tourism operators of the world with the best possible market intelligence please bear in mind that we were the first advocates of rural tourism for example when we just said that 2020 was going to be the year of rural tourism we realized that rural tourism and tourism for rural development is one of the major keys to recovery because domestic and nearby still keeps all our country's industries alive and because when you trigger and you you work on rural tourism you actually develop new destinations and as it was mentioned before new destinations require new ways of living with destinations so therefore do we need to go back to these numbers probably not to be more sustainable in the future but we need to be sure that we know what we're facing and we're facing incredible losses at macro economic level and therefore we are expecting really to go into a different situation in the years to come and this is why we are very confident that one of our latest forecasts which sees a recovery during 2022 and 2023 i don't know if you can look at this graph you will be able to see that probably the middle east is the one that looks the most optimistic we really need to work together for this and for togetherness we need something very concrete we need harmonized protocols simple measures a better communication 
and really a greater coordination between countries, especially for countries in the European Union that were able to enjoy the Schengen uh, uh, area, so that we're able to travel without any form of restriction. We need to make sure that we're going back to a safe situation that really allows the tourism industry to recover and to go to situations that are really allowing everybody to restart their business in a way or another. Otherwise, we're just going to see that companies are firing their employees and governments are trying to follow up as much as possible and as strong as they can. So once again, with this togetherness wish, I would like to really thank you for your attention. And please uh, bear in mind that we at UNWTO are your complete disposal. Shall you need anything? And we are always supporting the governments of our member states, in this case, specifically Italy, of whom we are very, very proud for the way that they've been, they've been facing these dramatic situations in the last few months, and the United Arab Emirates. Once again, God bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Prianto. Your message is, is clear. Right policies from institutions and operator, tourism operators. And I'm sure that um, our audience will be able to catch your message. Your message was um, absolutely clear and will um, make the best of, uh, um, of their work to comply. And thank you for, for your um, data and, all for, um, and for your words, which of course are, com um, are fundamental to understand uh, what you were saying to us, but uh, let's see what is the the answer of the of the Italian of the Italian community in this sense. Uh, Mr. Giorgio Palmucci, as I said, is the president of Anit. Um, Anit is. Um, is the tourist the government tourist board which is uh, um, which has the task of of course promoting the uh, the the image of uh, of the national tourist offers of course encouraging its its marketing uh, it takes care of all the promotion of the tourist abroad um, there is a great desire of Italy they've said um, the world is uh, is desiring Italy how important is in your opinion the implementation of sustainable strategies and the field of tourism in Italy in order um, in in order to implement and exploit uh, this desire that is um, that is flourishing. Thank you, thank you very much, Georgia, and uh, thank you to uh, Alessandra for the message about the vision of, for all, from all over the world. And uh, I would like to really thank you very much, uh, uh, Paolo Glisenti, for the um, uh, hospitality, and of course also for this uh, visit, the visit we made this morning. It was my second one, but it was more and more interesting, especially when we talk about sustainability. And so, and uh, well, for us, for Italian, it's true that, uh, as uh, Alessandra said, a worldwide pandemic was a disaster. We lived two years uh, of disaster, but uh, I think that we learned a lot. We, it was, it's very important what we learned, and what, what everyone, everyone in the world learned uh, um, because of the pandemic. First of all, the importance of tourism. The importance of tourism worldwide. So important for travelers, uh, not only for uh, some uh, countries, but for all over the world. And at the same time, is the importance of, of uh, uh, how to avoid the mistakes made in the past. Because, uh, for example, I remember that in 2019, that was the best year for the Italian tourism. We made uh, more than 440 million nights, hotel nights uh, in Italy, 50% from abroad, 50% domestic tourism. But uh, the problem, I remember that I was, in, uh, I was uh, invited to the uh, G20 for tourism in, in, Japan, in, in, Japan, in Japan, and it was incredible because uh, sustainability was uh, only in terms of over-tourism. The problem was the over-tourism. <laughs> and now we have, uh, well, it's very important to avoid the over-tourism in the future. We have to work uh, to make uh, new, uh, a new uh, growth 
of flows from all over the world in our country and all the countries where the tourism is important, also in Dubai and in the Emirates. But uh, I think that uh, uh, we have uh, to work in terms of sustainability because uh, all um, even if, uh, if in our, uh, we studied the uh, behavior of the Italian tourism, Italian tourists, and they are more and more interested in, in sustainability tourism, economic, cultural, and also in social tour and in social sustainability, especially with the Generation Z, the Generation e, uh, the Millennials, and so on. And, and so it's very important to work for. And I think that in this moment, we've because of pandemic, uh, well, we have, for example, in Italy, we have the PNRR, the, 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 the resolution and uh, um, plan, well, where the Minister of Tourism, also our government, are uh, investing just to prepare the, 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 the future growth of, of tourism uh, that we are waiting for. And I think that uh, uh, it's... Uh, as a, in it, as a National Tourist Board, we work to promote our countries, our beautiful countries, but working together with the region, with the minister, but with the region, with uh, the operator. And I think that uh, the most important is to talk about safety, security, because uh, not only now, but also in the future, safety will be uh, one of the most important reasons in the choice of a destination. And I think that uh, what our government made uh, till now and uh, with the uh, vaccine campaign and also with investment made uh, by the operator, uh, travel operator, uh, um, in, in, in uh, all, all tourism op all, uh, operator in the tourism sector, worked and invest even if the, the situation was so terrible. And so, and I finish, I think that uh, when I started working for tourism more than 30 years ago, I, I remember that uh, um, uh, the, the idea that uh, uh, for uh, the future of tourism uh, in our country, I remember uh, the, uh, what, the words of uh, Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King said, I have a dream. And then uh, I think that uh, now, e even if uh, we are in this terrible situation, we can go, uh, we can push for the re re restart of tourism in Italy and all over the world. Thank you. Yes. Absolutely, absolutely right. Sustainable tourism, we will hear a lot these words also from various perspectives uh, with our guests. And um, just uh, one last question regarding also the Italian panorama. Do you th um, uh, to what extent do you think that the in-person tourism experience is uh, irreplaceable? How important is for the tourists to be in person? It's, uh, it's so important because uh, anyway, anyway, traveling is an experience. And uh, yes, we can promote our countries uh, through all of the digital innovation to uh, present all kind of tourism our countries can offer to tourism from uh, uh, all over the world yeah. and from Italy. But... Uh, the experience, the emotions you have to live. To, to live. To you live. have to live. Live and, and so love. It's very important. Absolutely. And just one thing that I, I, I forgot, and it's very important that because of pandemic, Italians discover Italy. Because Italians don't know Italy, don't know the offer of the Italian destination, of Italian tourism, and uh, because of pandemic, they had to, but they discover the 58 uh, UNESCO sites, they discover the Borghi, they discover, they discover our country. And I remember that I was with uh, the, our minister in uh, Catholic University in Milano, and uh, uh, they presented the study, and this study, uh, 
50% of Italian even didn't, they didn't know the number and the name of the 20 region. Yeah. Just this, just to give an example. Absolutely. So it's very important also to push for the domestic tourism in our countries. There is a pro in this negative yeah. situation. Also me, from, from an, an, an Italian citizen perspective, it's true how we really discovered what is next to us, at, um, really next to us, our neighbor. Um, thank you, thank you very thank much. You. And uh, uh, now I wanted to make a quick question to Armando Brunini, um, the CEO of the Aeroporti di Milano, uh, SEA company. Uh, your company is, of course, uh, one of the 10 biggest uh, airport operation operators in Europe for goods, for both goods and uh, passenger traffic, but also is uh, the second, the second biggest in Italy for the number of passenger healed and the biggest uh, for the goods uh, transported. Um, before, um, uh, with Alessandra, we've talked about UN Net Zero before 2050 strategy, and we know that Aeroporti di Milano is taking important steps toward this, uh, this goal. In fact, uh, is committed to a zero emission goal uh, by 2030. Um, tell us more about this, and especially how are you facing the, uh, let's say, the challenge of attracting, uh, managing, or directing uh, the visitor flows, but um, in, at the same time, let's say, facilitating uh, collaboration uh, among different stakeholders and uh, um, towards an eco-friendly approach of tourism. Well, good afternoon once again, and thank you for, for the invitation. Well, uh, we've been committed to uh, sustainability of our airports more than 10 years now, but without any doubt, in the last couple of years, with the pandemic, even though there's no direct correlation between the pandemic and sustainability, there's been a change of philosophy and approach. And probably this change is threefold. First, we've uh, speeded up uh, our initiatives. So uh, we, we're doing much more and quicker. Uh, secondly, we're looking not only at the airport infrastructure as such, but we're looking above and beyond the airport infrastructure. And third, we've learned that on our own, we can't do enough. The challenge is so big, the sustainability challenge is so big that we need to cooperate uh, a lot more. And that's what's changing in our approach. And I can give you a few examples, I only have a few minutes, so I'll give you just a few examples to materialize what I just, what I just said. Uh, the first example is that, of course, uh, you know, we manage big terminals and they consume a lot of energy. And we have our own production, energy production plants, both in Malpensa and Linate. And uh, we need to quickly move to renewable sources and become more efficient. And we're doing that, but it's not enough. So we decided to select a partner. That selection process is in course. We will mm, finalize it before uh, the, the, the first semester of this year. And for sure, we will have one of the leading energy plays in Italy to be our partner in improving, in, in managing the energy uh, in our terminals. And the second is example uh, concerns not the airport infrastructure, but the way we can help airlines uh, move towards net zero, which is, of course, making available at our airports uh, sustainable aviation fuels and hydrogen, again, through cooperation. We have a cooperation agreement with ANI. I don't need to introduce ANI to, to all of you. Um, uh, and they will help us have SAF, sustainable aviation fuel, in, at our airports as quick as possible. As a matter of fact, in December, the first flight took off from Linate with sustainable aviation fuel. The second agreement is with the SNAM. Again, I don't need to, to introduce SNAM. And with them, we have a pilot project uh, financed by the European Commission within the Green Deal. And uh, we will uh, realize and implement a first pilot project uh, concerning a hydrogen production plant in Malpensa, which I think probably to, might be the first in, in a European uh, airport. Uh, the last example concerns destinations. We, of course, are tightly linked to Milan as a destination. The vast proportion of uh, the, our passengers are tourists. Of course, we have business passengers, but the vast majority are tourists, tourists which move out of Milan towards the world, but a lot of tourists coming into Milan. And actually, Milan moved up the ranking of the most visited European cities before the pandemic, and certainly we want to help Milan. Uh, we are part of the system in uh, recovering uh, the, those volumes. And uh, so we are part of Milano and Partners, which is the DMO of Milan. It's the, the destination management organization, and we are members of Milano and Partners, so we cooperate with the municipality and with other relevant organizations of Milan. 
and we are positioning Milan as a safe and sustainable uh, touristic destination. Basically, we, you can fly to Milan through one of our airports, then you can visit Milan through a very efficient public transport uh, uh, system. Uh, you can use car, electrical car sharing or bike sharing. Milan is very advanced in, in bike sharing and car sharing. And if you want to visit the surrounding areas, for example, Lake Como, you, there's a specific offer from the uh, Northern Italian Railways targeted for tourism. So you can take the train and, and go to Lake, Lake Como and your holiday will be a very sustainable holiday. So that's just to give you in a few minutes the general flavor of a few of the projects that we are carrying out in, in these years. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mrs. Bernini. Of course, our lines, um, airport uh, destinations are all part of the same um, of the same network when when talking about tourism and when talking about managing such an ha a wide hub like uh, Milano, Milano is. But I would like also to listen to the, another perspective, a perspective where we've, we've talked about the journey between Europe, Italy and the Gulf. And here with us, there's also uh, Mr. Hamza Mustafa, which is the CEO and uh, the P of um, P and O Marinas uh, um, of uh, of the P World, so Dubai um, Dubai Ports World's collection of world class luxury marinas. Uh, Twenty years or so ago, maybe the world luxury and the world tourism and sustainable tourism were rarely but side by side because um, travel was no, no exception and luxury, uh, luxury was another thing. But now luxury is n less about a thing and is more about an experience, isn't it? So what measure may be implemented in order to um, enhance uh, the sustainability of luxury tourism in your opinion? And what is a sustainable approach to uh, be competitive in uh, marine hubs? So when we talk about sustainability and sustainability tourism, what we need to understand that this is an ecosystem. You can't have just one part sustainable and the other not sustainable. What I mean by that is the entire journey, the entire process needs to be sustainable. If you want to say that you know, you've been a sustainable tourism or you've used the right tools to fall under the sustainable ecosystem. Now, in the past, it was all about staying in the most expensive hotel, having the best service, uh, flying first class. But maybe in 10 years, I'm not saying this has changed. I'm saying maybe in 10 years, it's not going to be about that. It's going to be about, okay, I traveled to a country and I didn't leave anything negative behind me from an environmental perspective. Maybe the, maybe the world changes and becomes there. We're not there yet. Maybe that's the approach. Now, we as business leaders, planners, need to understand that we have to do two things. Number one is we have to build for the future, because if you don't build for the future, you'll be caught behind. Now, we know that the, the term sustainability is spoken about a lot, and this is something people care about. Governments care, people care, travelers care. So as business leaders, we have to build for this. We also care as the business leaders. So to really build and to really start looking at this, let's look at other industries. Look, look, look at the automotive industry, which has been by far the most advanced. You know, the electric cars are out there. Now, I represent the maritime industry. Unfortunately, my industry is still catching up. So, you know, we're still, we're still far behind, although some of the cruise ships that I deal with, they've looked at alternative uh, energy. MSC, Italian cruise ship, has the, just, uh, it just launched a new ship, Virtuosa, which runs on uh, renewables. And they're in Dubai right now. So the maritime industry has a lot of catching up to do. It will catch up. There are other, other industries, other transport-related industries that we're learning from, that we're catching up to. It's a little bit more complicated in our perspective because is it going to be hydrogen? Is it going to be electric? What's the renewable? Is it going to be, what's the renewable energy that we're going to use? Nobody has the right answer. So it's, uh, it's coming up, but it's the future. We have to look at it, but we have to look at it holistically, everything. Can't be just you come in an electric car to go on a, a bus that uh, uses more diesel than the car. You don't do anything. 
Sure. You know, so you have to look at the whole system. Ecosystem maybe is the correct word, exactly. as you said, absolutely. And it's sure that maritime maritime world is doing important steps in this uh, um, in this sense. It's it's in interesting how we can, we're seeing the different perspective from the aviation maritime and also from the operators, but also the institutions. Um, now, uh, remaining in the maritime sector, I would like also to, uh, to, to, to ask a question to um, Rossella Carrara, who is uh, Vice President in the Corporate Relations and Sustainability for Costa Crociere, another uh, leading um, largest talent travel group and Europe number one cruise operator with, uh, let's say, more than 70, under, uh, 70 years of tradition in passenger shipping. Uh, Costa Crociere this year has... Um, is also the first company in the world that has um, received the, the famous and uh, honorable green star from the um, Italian Naval Registry uh, that certifies that all costs of vessels comply with the very strict environmental efforts and, uh, and standards. Of course, this is a, a matter of, of honor for the whole Italian ecosystem, if you can say that, and we are proud to, um, to have President Carrara here with us. Um, there is an important theme also when we talk about the sea, uh, you know, the sea is a very, uh, is a repetitive world here at, at the Italian pavilion because um, the world pavilion is, um, the, the narrative of the world pavilion is about the sea and one important is the link between the Mediterranean and the Gulf and the Middle East and Costa Crociere is exactly linking these two important apps of the world. It's one of the biggest players in the Mediterranean, without any doubt, but also in the Middle East. So, from, from your experience, um, Mrs. Carrara, what, um, how the increasing demand for sustainable experiences in the, in the field of, coastal, uh, of cruises is changing, the, uh, let's say, the maritime tourists also in, um, in the Mediterranean area? Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, first of all. And... Um Unfortunately, I'm not uh, in Dubai, where actually I was uh, a few weeks ago to uh, to inaugurate the season in the in the Middle East uh, for our new ship, uh, Costa Firenze, in uh, inaugurating a new uh, very beautiful terminal, cruise terminal, uh, uh, Dubai Harbor. So. Um, I still have the images in in, in my mind. It, it was uh, just great to be there. Um, yeah, Costa Costa is the Italian operator. We fly uh, the Italian flag and we were born in Genova more than 70 years ago. And I have to say that the tradition of innovation of our company has always uh, been um, directed towards finding ways and innovation and new technologies uh, that could uh, increase the sustainability of our product. For sure, uh, this is um, uh, a path that we had taken uh, a long time ago, even in times uh, pre-COVID times. Uh, we've been, for example, the first to invest uh, and create the whole infrastructure for LNG. Uh, so we are the only group that now has four ships uh, run by liquefied natural gas uh, in the world. Um, and this is, you know, a technology that uh, decreases uh, emissions. Uh, it's the, the most advanced available in the maritime sector right now. We're working for the electrification of, um, of uh, and the availability of shore power for our ships. So the, the path on the technological development has been set a long time ago. Um, what we believe and what we see is that our clients, our customers, more and more look for enriching experiences. And enriching experiences, you can offer them enriching experiences only if you work in a very uh, close relationship with destinations. And that is also part of sustainability. Part of sustainable cru cruising and sustainable tourism it's also the respect for the local cultures. It's going beyond uh, what is more known about a destination and trying to give our customers uh, new experiences that are more authentic, more respectful of the local cultures, more respectful of the environment. So again, we bring it back to the issue of togetherness that Alessandra Briante was uh, mentioning before and the fact that if we want to have 
a more sustainable experience for a guest, it's not only the operator and the technology and the hardware that needs to be sustainable, but it's also the software, the type of experience and the type of relation that we create with destinations. And of course, cruising, which has been, you know, long, for a long time, um, indicated as, uh, you know, a source of uh, over tourism, I would like to say that it only represents a very small percentage of uh, the global tourism industry, just 1%. Uh, but still, I think we have a great opportunity to work together with destinations, making sure that we spread out our value and we spread out our customers, uh, giving them the opportunity to experience more destinations, more locations, uh, to meet the local cultures and the local people in a, in a wider range of uh, destinations and excursions. And this, of course, in turn generates less environmental impact, less over tourism, and it increases the economic value, which I would like to remember that it's a, an important pillar of a sustainable tourism industry. Sustainable tourism means uh, social, it means environmental, but it also means economic value, employment, jobs, uh, destination uh, development. Uh, to summarize all this, what we have done, we want to redefine the leadership of a tourism brand like ours. And we have developed a manifesto, which is our Costa manifesto for uh, a value-driven, sustainable and inclusive tourism, which develops in 10 points, which are our commitment towards uh, society and towards destinations, and also a very important guideline for our people, for our colleagues, for all of us, to make sure that when we plan our activities, we take a strict consideration of these principles, the fact that we, we want to be allies of the destinations, the fact that we want to uh, look at the communities, not only at a set of touristic attractions, and also the fact that we can be with our ships, uh, we can be a great platform for, um, on one side, awareness for the public that, you know, stays on our ships for seven days, so we can create a big community of responsible visitors, because we have the opportunity of educating them and raising their awareness when they travel with us. But at the same time, we can be a great vehicle for promotion uh, and greater knowledge of the destinations. So these are the 10 principles we want to work with that we are presenting in, to a wide range of stakeholders. And I'm glad to see um, Mr. Palmucci and Enit there. He, he, Enit has been one of the official endorsers uh, of this manifesto when we first presented it uh, last, uh, last summer. But I invite, um, you know, all uh, tourism uh, representatives, all destinations to ally with us on these principles so that we can work for a better uh, development of a real sustainable tourism and coastal tourism. And if you allow me, I would like to end my, uh, my, my speech here with a short video, which I think summarizes uh, more than, uh, you know, better than I can do what our philosophy is and how we want to work together with the tourism ecosystem. Thank you. And I think you should be able to send it.
to Costa Crociere. Thank you to all our guests uh, for this first panel. We thank you very much for being with us and, um, and for sharing your, your experience about tourism. Please, a round of applause for this interesting and incredible debate. Let's, without losing any time, I would like to uh, go on, on, the next, on the next panel uh, that will now focus on digital experience. Um, and uh, it is now a deep pleasure to introduce you the guests that will be the protagonists of this, of this panel. I'm talking about Carlo Dazzaro Biondo, the CEO of uh, Nouvel. Um, thank you, thank you for being with us. Please give a round of applause for him. Thank you very much. So thank you for um, Kango Din, the CEO of Olivetti. Thank you also to you for being with us. Thank you very much. We have Bob Cavley, uh, Senior Vice President of Online Sales Development at Emirates and Head of Emirates Holiday. Thank you. Thank you very much for being with us today, you too. And last but not least, we also have uh, a digital connection uh, with uh, Renzo Iorio, the head of uh, Ferrovie dello Stato Italiano, the Tourism Task Force. Welcome, welcome uh, uh, Renzo, welcome to the, uh, virtually to the Italian Pavilion, to you too. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to start with, with the fresh chat uh, with the second panel with uh, uh, Mr. Biondo, the CEO of Nuvi. For those who don't know, uh, Nuvi is just um, is the team's data center infrastructure, um, especially in cloud movies, uh, cloud um, activities. Uh, it's, uh, of course, a center of excellence. So, Mr. Um, Dasar Biondo, could, can, in your opinion, um, cloud platforms for mobility as a service and, let's say, more in general as a technology, well, encourage new models of tourism experiences? And um, do you think this also may um, open a relationship between travelers and operators? Well, I've been now working on internet topics for 25 years, and I remember in 1998, 2000, 2005, tourism was the most advanced sector in the usage of the internet. The first ones to create the success of the big companies like Google, like Booking.com and many others. It's probably the only sector that has vertical search engines that today have brands that can't compete with Google. So we would say, fantastic, usage of technology is there and is great. But since then, what happened? As users, we expect much more in terms of experience than what we live today in the tourism sector. Uh, if you compare the experience of buying something with Amazon with the experience of waiting at the queue of a hotel to give the same data 10 and 10 times uh, every time you get there, or to sit down uh, and have to transmit data like your health passport continuously, to the same people every day. Uh, if you think about the difficulty of renting a car, where you have to give always the data and, and the cues and the problems, the difficulty I think was said before by uh, um, uh, the previous panel is it's a fragmented sector. And authorities have made it very difficult to share data. I mean, uh, of course, the GDPR in Europe is a great idea. I mean, I love GDPR as a philosophy. But I think it has been the biggest favor that the Commission could do at comp to companies like Google and Facebook. Because it makes it so difficult to share data, they are the only ones who can actually do it. So if we want to be serious and create this sustainability and want to make change, there are a few things we need to do to help the sector. One, adopt technology for the information systems of the tourism companies. So yes, cloud technology that allows to use the information system of very advanced companies for a low price is an important one, but it's not the only one. Two, really created after 25 years, we talk about it, you know, the experience passport. I mean, I have a watch like this. I just transmit the data. If I want to a hotel, to, a, to any chain, I can, people can know what I love before I get into a restaurant. They can know the allergies of my wife. Uh, or, or because she's allergic to fish, or other things. Easily, we don't use the potential of technology in tourism the way we could and we should. And today, it was the most advanced sector 10 years ago. 
today agriculture, finance, retail are using technology much better than tourism. The reason is fragmentation and difficulty of sharing data. If we want to fight against those things and do something about it, tourism can get back to the place it should have, which is the first one in user of technology because it's a sector that needs it more than any other else. Yes, absolutely. Data and fragmentation and about data, of course. Um, Mr. Kwang Dong Ding uh, would absolutely tell us more about it. Um, uh, Olivetti has, has been an historical brand of the Italian factory uh, and for the team groups of IoT, Internet of Things, solution with a vast portfolio, so and 5G technology. Um, so, to what extent, in your opinion, the Internet of Things already um, influenced the realm of, uh, of travel, of traveling so far? And what's, uh, what is the expectation in the post-pandemic world and the, ability, the availability of the use of data um, in a changing environment between travelers and operators again? Okay, thank you. Thank you, first of all, to invite me. Um, likely, I have the same mind of, uh, of Carlo. <laughs> so uh, I, I think that, <laughs> likely, uh, that customers is changed, dramatically, uh, dramatically changed uh, their expectation also boosted by uh, the pandemic. So the use of uh, digital tools is boosted. And, and also the expectation of customers when, uh, when it comes from customer experience uh, is dramatically uh, changing. So all the, all the industries has to uh, adapt to that. Uh, tech giants set the pace, uh, so the, the customer has, uh, like uh, buying something to Amazon, has some expectations. And this is valid also for, uh, for, for tourism, of, of course. And through technology, IoT in particular, in 5G, we can provide uh, uh, augmented experience, uh, let me say augmented tourism to, to travelers. And starting from uh, the booking experience on the exploration experience, but also during the trip itself, uh, they can uh, visit remotely uh, a site in a way that was impossible some years ago. But also, technology can enrich the way they enjoy the site with augmented reality, with, uh, with a lot of experience uh, through 5G and uh, augmented, uh, augmented reality. Uh, we as a team group delivered in the past month a couple of examples of that. Uh, let me say, we can say Pompeii archaeological sites now uh, completely covered by 5G technology and uh, this allows uh, experiences like augmented reality, immersive 360 experiences, and the same thing for Mausoleo di Augusto in Rome. So this is just a couple of examples of what technology can do uh, on site, not only allowing people to remotely visit the site. Uh, the other area where technology can help tourism is indeed big data analytics. This is a kind of buzzword, 80% uh, of corporates invest in big data analytics, this is not a new. Uh, but this is valid as well for tourism, and is, uh, at the moment the use of uh, big data is uh, well below the potential in tourism sector. Um, in this time after pandemic, we are in a kind of uh, super unpredictable situation. 2021 has been very, very different from 2019, before the pandemic, and even more different since uh, 2020, in the middle of the lockdown. So the, 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 the value chain of tourism is used to, to use uh, historical data to forecast or to analyze uh, uh, what happens to their uh, businesses. And this simply is, it doesn't work anymore. Uh, because times is so different, it's very difficult to understand if a marketing campaign worked well, uh, if the customers is uh, meeting uh, the, the expectations. Uh, it's simply impossible to, 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 to have this information. And Team Group, through Olivetti in particular, can provide uh, a lot of uh, data analytics. Uh, for instance, we, we all know that in the 2020, the travelers dropped by 60% almost and then is recovering in the 2021, uh, but not at the level of pre-pandemic. Th these are information that we all know. But using big data analytics, we can, s we can know that in December, in Ivrea, a uh, very small town in Italy, that f by chance is the site of where uh, Olivetti was born a lot of years ago, that is a very small town, I can, uh, I can measure the, the number of tourist, uh, tourist, uh, touristic flow 
uh, in December, in January, or this, the day of Christmas, we can understand if the um, people, uh, where they come from, from Italy, from other uh, places, if they took a car, a train, a plane, if they stayed the night uh, or they stayed another, in another place. So all these information are, are available. The, the, the op touristic operator has to access to it. It's very easy. And this is a, a concrete lever to navigate uh, across these unpredictable times. I, I, I hope that the tourism, tourism industry will recover what uh, they lost uh, uh, due, due to the pandemic. But I'm sure of one thing. Without technology, this is simply impossible. Technology is now a mandatory ingredient uh, to the recipe. Yeah, thank you very much. That's, that's actually uh, very true. And also, I think um, Mr. Abub Kavli will surely confirm what um, the previous guest will has said. Um, he's um, Senior Vice President of Online Sale in Emirates. Uh, Emirates particularly is, uh, um, is it's operating in a hub which is absolutely connecting the Europe and Asia. As a, it's, a, it's a cross-sectional point where uh, everything meets. And um, in fact, in your opinion, digital economy uh, will be uh, maybe fundamental in, the, in this transition. And, um, and how, in your opinion, is uh, the process of uh, the digital economy will help in the process of communicating uh, with tourists, uh, with visitors, and uh, also help in the marketing tourist uh, services? Yep, thank you for having me. And uh, yeah, Emirates, um, in terms of digitization and the digital economy, we found, just like many other industries that were referred to in the previous panel, and now they've been disrupted. If you look at the car industry, we talked about fashion retail. Um, if you look at food delivery and things like that, there's been a lot of change. So from an Emirates perspective, um, and obviously I do online sales, we've seen a lot of change over the last few years. For example, when I travel now, you know, the first time I may potentially speak to somebody is when I'm on board the aircraft. So through a combination of airports and what airlines are doing, there's a very seamless way through. Um, and without the paper, when you're carrying something like 60 million passengers a year, each piece makes a difference in terms of what we do. So I think, you know, it's been revolutionized in terms of when you make your booking, previously you would um, book a flight and that was it. Now, prior to that, you've got fair brands and ancillaries. You have an opportunity to decide how much flexibility and what you want to pay for that. The customs have got the choice of how much baggage they want to carry. So there's a lot more flexibility before. When you're actually traveling, you know, we're giving you a lot more information about the check-in, boarding gates. It's all mobile, um, digital. I think mobility will play a key part, and I'm talking about the actual mobility of the person. So a device is almost a standalone device. Today, if you lose your device, everything is stored on the cloud. You know, we were talking about that earlier. So I think leveraging all this in terms of personalization will be critical. I think, again, nowadays with that seamless journey, before I travel, I can check the menu. Um, I can look at what movies I want to watch on our in-flight. In so it's almost making it stress-free, seamless travel, where it's always been a little bit antagonistic previously in terms of your travel. So. What can we do? Can we gamify things to make it even more fun to travel? Um, I think once you're on, the, on board, again, it's a physical product, so there's degrees of sustainability and um, things that you can do in terms of the environment. I think we've looked a lot at what we can do with our amenity kits from sustainability perspective. Our blankets are made from recycled plastic bottles. I'm not an engineer, but you know, at, at the, if you extrapolate what we do, that's saving 3,000 bottles an hour from the landfill. So small things. Once you get to the destination, um, we're trying to work closely with our partners from Emirates Holidays perspective in terms of people increasingly want um, hotels that have got sustainability kind of guidelines. There's nothing really globally. But I think all of this combines together in terms of what we can do. From a marketing perspective, I think things, again, like the mobile app and things like that, we can reach people before you would plan your journey before you traveled, and that was it. You had to have it all done. Now people are constantly changing plans, amending things. If you look at events and tours and things like that, I think most people here would agree, you actually book it when you're at the destination or on the way there rather than before. And I think digi the digital economy has facilitated that in terms of booking, again, tickets are paperless from our third party providers or whoever may, you may use. So I think that's been a big part of it. I think we're also looking at things like, will email exist in five years time? Do people use it that much, you've got social media and anything more that might come. 
So I think really, you know, in the kind of travel and tourism industry, I think the digitization will be pivotal. I still don't think it's been kind of holistically harnessed, but I think there's still a lot more that we can do. And again, the final point on that is more like digital identity. So if you look at visas now, you know, it used to be when you traveled, you had it on your passport and it was, and it's a bit weird now when you just get an email saying your visa's been approved and you just travel. And I think will the, will the same thing extend to passports in the future? Going back to our mobile, it's the one thing you have with you all the time and as Wi-Fi becomes more prevalent, how does that kind of hybrid model work from a physical pro perspective? So I think from a marketing perspective, you're marketing all the way through now, even when the person's in destination. Um, from a holiday perspective, customers want information in a timely manner. So I think a lot's been done, but I still think there's kind of strides that can be done. Absolutely. We can also talk about an eco-friendly approach uh, visitor experience, let's say, at all stage from the booking to the, to the, to the travel. Um, well, um, what, uh, we turn to, um, from the airways to the, uh, to the railways, and we go to um, Renzo Iorio, which is head of um, Ferrovie dello Stato Italiane and uh, the Tourism Task Force. Um, Ferrovie dello Stato is, uh, by the way, the largest investor in mobility and uh, infrastructure in Italy, and it's basically the major provider of, uh, um, of moving people inside the, the Italian territory. Um, how, in your opinion, digital tools and platforms can um, support or uh, assure the uh, sustainable uh, transition uh, in tourism in this sense? Well, I, I do think that the digital dimension and mainly, if I may, the consistency of the digital approach will be crucial. Uh, as I already mentioned, the, the pandemic crisis has enormously accelerated people, digital approach and digital consumption. Uh, let us think at the four billion smartphone in the world or uh, the fact that in three months uh, we gained uh, five years in uh, the growth, the forecasted growth in digital e-commerce. So really today, digital is the most powerful current tool for connecting people and connecting services. So in some uh, aspect also linked to the theme of, of, the, of the expo, connecting mind and create the future, against uh, is the real tool on which I think we have to concentrate on. And on the other side, pandemic also increased the consumer care for sustainability issues. And now more than uh, around 60% of tourists care and choose and look for sustainable solutions. So I think that uh, to be effective, in my opinion, it should be a digital, but a digital designed and organized around and for the need of the customer, uh, designed and conceived the stay in the shoes of the traveler, and not only, probably as has been done until today, more in the shoes of the technology experts or the one of the single producer who wants simply to sell his own products. Uh, it, it should be also a, a tool able to connect companies and uh, allow the people who has the responsibility, both at local and uh, uh, central level, of uh, government uh, concerning uh, the flows, uh, concerning the points. Uh, mainly giving more value to existing assets and services, of course, uh, connecting and enable, uh, which is crucial in our, in our sector, uh, which is so fragmented. And in this sense, for instance, the, the mobility as a service, the, the multimodality that we platform that we have, uh, give resp effective response to that but also enhance and immediately market new infrastructures and new businesses, uh, making products and services to be known and accessible to the people. And uh, it has already been mentioned, but I think it's really crucial uh, to create active and virtuous policies to cope and smooth the over-tourism and enhancing the customer experience. So uh, the opportunity that we have with the next generation EU in Europe and with the PNRR in Italy allow us to really create a, a, a vision and create a system for tourism uh, who takes care for uh, tourists and travelers, but at the same time for local residents affected by the tourism and for the companies that uh, create jobs and value on destination. So I do think that we must design and implement a, 
really an approach model and not only just a growth model uh, that uh, know how to cultivate and preserve. Uh, we have to be in tourism and the colleague of Mubi uh, correctly highlighted uh, at, the, at the beginning of this panel, we have to be more uh, responsible farmers in tourism rather than simply uh, economic player like probably we have been in the future. And uh, uh, in order to get that, I think that really a coordinated design of the action is needed. A really global partnership as a country is needed and is there. And at Ferrovia dello Stato, our action goes exactly in this way because we are acting huge investment in rail and network. I would just highlight that by 2026, 20, 83% of our 17,000 kilometers of network will be electrified, so zero CO2 to emissions is the highest percentage in all Europe, but also expanding the network both in the inner areas and in the high speed uh, network. Uh, 60, 120 stations will be refurbished not only in terms of services to the travel, but really to become the inter interchange hub within the city. Renewal of the fleets, uh, uh, the workshop, slow mobility, and and smart roads that will be implemented. And together with that, we have to make the software intervention, the platform that I already mentioned, which assure a continuous customer assistance and information and services at destination to the travelers, not only on side of uh, on board of our fleet, but uh, why they are moving, uh, notwithstanding which is the model that they are choosing. Uh, of course, investment in the digitalization of the network and uh, working with uh, the uh, local authorities uh, today. Uh, we are launching a partnership with Friuli Venezia Giulia, which is really make in order to let the people travel and experience the region in the inner area and uh, in uh, the, the largest attractors. So a, a 360 degrees approach around the travelers in order to get zero impact for 2050. And I do think that the future uh, will not necessarily be in uh, uh, in digital intended like uh, virtual reality, etc. But really uh, be in traveling, in looking around us, meeting people, and marine landscape and arts. Uh, uh, this, uh, we have to be able to travel in back, to be able to uh, come back to travel, to see people, uh, to know by first hand. Exactly what I guess we are missing the most in these two years and digital is the real enabler that will allow us to do it, to do safely and to do quick uh, uh, with the intelligence of our, uh, that we are able to provide in it. Thank you. So connection, digitalization, and I would say eco-friendly approach, uh, tourist experience uh, are the three key words uh, for the future of tourism in the digital ecosystem. I would like to thank you very much for, for being here, for being with us in this uh, second panel. And uh, uh, please uh, give a round of applause to our wonderful guests who have. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you also to Renzo Iorio. Thank you for being virtually with us. And we proceed with, uh, with the last but not least um, panel that will ultimately um, will talk about the um, experience, experimental and slow journey and a world which, um, which has been challenged day by day. New frontiers of tourism are key in order to discover the world we live in. So let me change my position and um, refer to this uh, big screen we have in front of us and this wonderful flag surrounding us. Uh, because the next uh, three guests that we'll have today are connected the, in this digital arena virtually. And I'm talking about Patrizia Lombardi, president of the Italian University Network for uh, Sustainable Development. Um, Rosa Laura Romeo, uh, which is program officer at the Mountain Partnership uh, Secretariat. And um, Yuri Basilico, the founder of Vasentiero. This three guests will be here with us talking about the, uh, the new frontiers of uh, slow tourism and, um, uh, and experiential tourism. 
I don't know if we have already the connection with them or um, if you're experiencing some problem, this is the, of course, the, the, the good part of the live sessions that we at Italy Pavilion try to always, uh, always put in place, notwithstanding all the difficulties. Um, I don't know if the direction can give me some signals and if we are ready to connect to our, um, to our three guests. Um, in the meantime, let me introduce you a little bit what, what is the next, the next step. Giovanni has talked a lot about uh, his experience in Polynesia and uh, slow tourism and experiment, experiential tourism. Why, do, why this is important? It is important because um, it is by, um, it's, it is by new, these new fronters that will have a, ch a concrete change in a challenging world. Here we are, so we all see you here, are our, our guests. I have already mentioned them, but I will um, recall Patrizia Lombardi, president of the Italian University Network for Sustainable Development Network, uh, Rosa Laura Romeo, program officer at the Mountain Partnership Secretariat, and Yuri Basilico, founder of Vasentiero. We will discover more of each of the three projects. But let me turn a little bit you a little bit more about you, and let's start with with Patrizia Lombardi, the president of this uh, wonderful initiative of the University Network. The University Network for Sustainable Development uh, is the first um, the first um, um, is, is the first time in where all uh, Italian university institution uh, committed and devoted to um, environmental sustainability and uh, social responsibility. And uh, as probably uh, Mrs. Lombardi would tell, Slow Journey is part of a new way of uh, understanding well-being. Uh, and uh, what we w want to ask you is how we can, um, how this university network can provide the right education to the new generation in order to build a new way of, of, of touring, of traveling, of uh, uh, more respectfully of the environment. <laughs> Thank you, Georgia, and uh, um, good afternoon to, to everyone. Very sorry not being there, but I will be soon, and I also been uh, already uh, visited uh, the um, wonderful pavilion, uh, Italian pavilion. Um, well, I uh, today uh, I, I really uh, thanks the organizer for this invitation because uh, it's uh, uh, very important to bring uh, to this discussion also the viewpoint uh, of this slow, um, slow journey. And uh, I'm going to uh, present it uh, in connection with uh, uh, the uh, mission of our university network, uh, which involves uh, more than 80 universities in Italy, uh, with the aim of promoting Agenda 2030 and uh, um, helping uh, uh, all uh, uh, local communities uh, to uh, make uh, and accelerate the transition towards sustainable development. Um, well, we, we understood that uh, as universities, uh, we play a major role uh, in this transition uh, um, uh, because we are institutions that provide education, first of all. So we educate the future manager, but also the, the future citizen. Uh, uh, and, and also uh, we provide innovation and research and also services to society. And this is the reason why um, we decided to, um, to bring and to collaborate together in, in order to um, help uh, uh, all Italian system in, uh, uh, in this transition. Uh, we work across different working group um, and, uh, uh, and we uh, promote uh, and sensibilize uh, um, communities. So not only students, but also um, university staff and local communities, citizens are all involved in, uh, in our um, awareness rising uh, uh, activities. And uh, I'm, uh, uh, I would like to, to talk particularly uh, on one specific um, event that we develop every year and we have started uh, very uh, before the, the COVID. Um, the, the, the slow journal is about uh, um, climbing for climate. So it is a, a awareness rising activity that uh, 
uh, try to uh, make uh, uh, people aware of uh, uh, the consequences uh, uh, of climate change uh, and of the uh, global warming. Um, we, we all know that climate change is uh, uh, really a very problematic, uh, uh, but sometimes uh, we need to be more close to uh, understand better the consequences that are uh, dramatic uh, uh, of this uh, um, problem, of this planetary pro problem, uh, particularly the uh, loss uh, the loss in uh, biodiversity and also uh, well the melting of the glaciers and, and therefore we decided to promote and to organize every year a walking uh, visit to our Alps, Apennines, mountains and all other um, territorial context where there are consequences of uh, uh, this problem. Um, you know, Italy is uh, the country of uh, a beautiful natural landscape, but also the country of slow food. Um, and, is, uh, uh, and, and, and we, we really understand the importance of slow education. That means uh, the attitude to reflect, to understand, and to connect with sensorial aspect to um, the uh, environmental issues and to the problems. Um, this is why we started in 2019, thanks to the idea of one of our university members, the Brescia University, and with the cooperation of the Italian Alpine Club, we have started this journey and we started to walk um, across uh, um, the uh, Adamello uh, Alps glacier that was the first one that we walked um, during the lockdown uh, uh, we decided to promote as well uh, a, a diffused event where uh, more than uh, 30 universities uh, and about 15 region have been involved in uh, um, this sensorial experience uh, in order to uh, understand understand really all these consequences and why is important is important because we we recognize that everyone play a role in uh, uh, this planetary uh, global challenge and therefore we just not have to think that is the government that uh, uh, require to take uh, an action. We have to take an action as well. Um, the contact with uh, the consequences uh, of uh, uh, the dramatic consequences of the climate change um, uh, are also uh, very much based on our individual choices. And this is the reason why we have decided to climb uh, without climbing I and mean, walking uh, through all all this uh, different uh, uh, landscaping, uh, mountains, uh, uh, and uh, uh, also to visit the um, what uh, what is uh, um, just uh, uh, living from the melting of uh, uh, the glaciers, uh, including uh, the southeast one uh, uh, in Gran Sasso. That was the last visit that we had uh, last September. Um, well, we believe that uh, uh, through this kind of initiative, uh, uh, putting uh, uh, in front of the evidence of our actions, uh, everyone can better understand and can better react. Um, uh, this is just one example. We have other different examples in our uh, educational uh, working group as well in, in our climate change working group. And if you want to know more, I invite you all on the 18th January when in the Italian pavilion we will have the pleasure to um, uh, provide the forum on UN Decade Action by Higher Education Institute.
institution where we invite we we have uh, uh, invited all uh, um, our uh, student uh, winner of uh, hackathon and challenge based initiative that we have prepared in relation to the um, to the seventh and also to the G20 uh, presidency uh, of last year uh, relating to uh, climate change. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Lombardi. Absolutely. We're waiting for you here at the Italian Pavilion together with all the um, Italian universities. And now it's time for um, Rosa Laura Romeo, uh, Program Officer of uh, at the Mountain Partnership uh, Secretariat. Uh, it's, um, she will uh, strive, she will, she will talk a little bit about, about how important are um, uh, mountains and uh, uh, the mountains development across the world in the, uh, in the tourism sector. Um, Maria uh, Rosa Laura, what uh, sustainability uh, tourism plays a key role? Also, there is uh, um, a new report that has been launched by the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations and the UNWTO uh, at an International Mountain Day. What is the situation in the present pandemic contingency and uh, how sustainable tourism can offer a mountain community a path, a path to uh, prosperity and inclusion? Thank you, Georgia, and good afternoon, everyone. I was in Dubai a few, well, a few weeks ago now, and it was a pleasure to visit the Italian Pavilion. So it's a pleasure to be with you again, even if virtually. And thank you very much for devoting this session to mountains. Mountains, uh, well, we all see mountains as magnificent, as impressive, as massive, but in reality, mountains are, can be very fragile. And mountain people are, uh, in most of the cases, very vulnerable. They are socially and economically excluded from the main uh, processes, and they have suffered very much because of the pandemic. Uh, we have 1 billion, 100,000 mountain people around the world. And how do these 1 billion uh, live in developing countries? So we have 1 billion people living in mountain areas in developing countries. And the vast majority of these people are food insecure, which in the United Nations language means that they are at risk of hunger and malnutrition. And they are at risk of not being able to feed their children throughout the years. So uh, it's very important to recognize that tourism can be and is a very important source of income for this population. In normal time, uh, tourism, in particular rural tourism, is really an important uh, element of the mountain livelihood, of the mountain economies in developing countries in particular, but around the world. The three main areas that are supporting the mountain economies are remittances, agriculture and tourism. And these three have been, for different reasons, very, very seriously affected by the COVID pandemics. We know that remittances have been affected by the global economic crisis that have decreased you know, the working opportunities for uh, immigrants around the world. So the remittances have decreased. The agriculture has been affected because the middlemen were not able to uh, buy these extra products from the agricultural areas. And tourism, we have heard today, and we know that uh, you know, in 19, 19, well, last year, the decrease in tourism was about 74% in international tourism. And um, it's true that in many countries, uh, national tourism has you no know, increased so many people have looked at within their country for uh, for holidays for vacation but this has not uh, compensated the reality of most uh, mountain communities around the world so economic economically mountain people are uh, you no know, are facing during this pandemic a, you know, a big uh, crisis in their income and this is affecting a very serious situation so this is why we have uh, uh, started this very good and close cooperation with the World Tourism Organization to, first of all, understand how mountain people can be supported to recover from COVID in, a most, you know, in the most quick and efficient way. And also uh, to better understand how many people are going to mountain areas for tourism. You would be surprised to know that this is not at all known. We know that about 15, 20% of global tourists are going to mountain areas, but we are not absolutely sure that this data is, uh, is uh, updated. So we are working with WTO to update this information. And this is very timely, not only for the reason I've just expressed, but also because the United Nations General Assembly has just declared 
this year, 2022, as International Year of, the, of uh, Sustainable Mountain Development. So this year, 2022, is devoted by the United Nations to promote sustainable development in mountains, and tourism is going to be a very important component of that. So what we know is also that tourists, uh, sorry, that mountains are very seriously affected by climate change. So there is an urgent need to promote adaptation in mountain areas. And also for tourists, this is very, very relevant. Well, we know that the snow period is, uh, is changing in many, many uh, parts of the world. And this, is as, this has a very big uh, impact on, on, uh, on the winter tourists. When we see that uh, the snow period is uh, reducing, is shrinking, we understand that uh, the, the livelihood of many people or many communities living of mountain tourists in winter is going to be very seriously modified. So it's important to expand the tourist season and uh, ensure that activities are offered around the year. So somehow it would be good if um, the opportunity of this uh, uh, slowdown on tourism could be, uh, could be uh, covered with uh, training opportunities for mountain people so that they can improve their offer of mountain tourism uh, to ensure that the moment the tourism will start again, they will be ready for facing this, uh, this new wave of tourism. It's also important to um, to keep in mind that it's very important that uh, the tourists should benefit the vulnerable groups. So the the training should focus on on youth for sure that are the uh, well the the steward of uh, the mountain development on indigenous people that are so dominant in mountain areas and have such a rich culture and tradition that can really be of extreme interest for for, for tourists and women who are all often left in mountain areas when men migrate in search of a better job so it's important that these activities that would focus on preparing for the new tourists uh, really target these uh, vulnerable groups, these key groups that uh, could really play a key role in promoting tourism. So I would like to say that uh, mountain people can be very creative and they are already uh, providing a, wide, a very wide range of uh, opportunities for tourists. Uh, and I would like to mention just a couple of years. So for instance, in Iran, uh, we have a group of uh, uh, nomad uh, communities from Bakhtiari, and they are offering to um, tourists the possibility of spending some, some days with them, traveling around the beautiful Iranian mountains. And, um, and this uh, uh, has produced some significant income that has been reinvested in, uh, for instance, in uh, solar, water, eaters, etc. So the, the impact uh, was really uh, immediately beneficial for the communities. Another example that I would like to share with you is from Ladakh, from India and in the Himalaya, where they are organizing with the Astronomical Society some travels to look at the stars. So stargazing during the night, and this has also uh, been very successful and has improved the livelihood of many communities around the world. There, are, there is also a group of, um, of feminist climbers that are organizing a um, climbing tour for women only that are also very successful. So mountain communities are very affected by, uh, by COVID, by climate change, by their uh, uh, social and economic exclusion, but they are also leading the recovery and they are also very creative in providing interesting solutions. And uh, so we hope that this international year of sustainable mountain development can really be uh, you know, a turning point for ensuring that mountain people are really uh, benefiting uh, from from tourists, they are really the ones that are promoting and leading the recovery from uh, from this halt on tourism in mountain areas. So thank you very much for this opportunity and uh, let's hope we can continue working together on mountain tourism. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shirley. Shirley, we will see uh, mountains on a different light from, from, from your contribution, Shirley. Um, so now I want to uh, give the floor to our last guest, Yuri Basilico, 
who is um, who has taken uh, an, um, an unprecedented challenge uh, in his life. Yuri Basilico is the founder of Vasentiero. Uh, Vasentiero is a project started in 19 uh, in 2019, uh, and is engaged in the in this challenge of crossing crossing the entire Sentiero Italia, the Italian path on foot. Uh, we're talking about a 7,000 kilometers line, which is linking all the high routes of our Bel Paese, and it's, uh, um, it, 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 win the, it won the longest track uh, in the world. Um, Yuri, please, um, what are the ingredients of this, of this wonderful journey and project that you, uh, you, have, um, you have carried on, and uh, in the light of your experience, how it is possible to, um, to synthesize more people to embark on slow tourism? Hi everybody. Hi Georgia and thank you for the invitation. Um, I'd like to start with a brief introduction to, to Vasentiero. So uh, a few years ago in 2016, um, we heard for the first time, we heard about the Sentiero Italia or Grand Italian Trail, which is a mountain trail which crosses the whole country along its mountain chains. So the Alps, the Apennini from Friuli Venezia Giulia to Sardinia. And actually, as you were saying, is a uh, it is the longest mountain trail in the world, in one of the most beautiful uh, countries in the world. So basically, it was already uh, a brand, an outstanding brand. Uh, but at the time, the Sentiero Italia was uh, pretty um, unknown, it was abandoned. So we were very surprised uh, by the fact that such a treasure with, with its impressive uh, uh, potential for the islands uh, was pretty unknown. So together, we had this uh, crazy idea. We created an expedition on foot along the whole trail in order to promote the Sentiero and to awake the sleeping giant. And uh, by doing that, uh, let's say to put the Italian highlands under the spotlight, testifying their uh, actual situation, so their beauty, their fragilities. Um, we started our expedition in 2019, as you were saying, from the Gulf of Trieste in the very northeast of Italy. And during the last three years, we hiked the, all the Alps and the Apennino. And uh, a few months ago, we completed our expedition after almost uh, 8,000 kilometers on our foot. It was a kind of uh, a slow tourism uh, manifesto, um, let's say. Apart from hiking, and uh, we go to your question, uh, we documented the route and the places we crossed it day by day, stage by stage, uh, in order to, to publish an international guide on the territories, which you can find also on our website. And then we shared our experience, both digitally and uh, analogically speaking. So on one side, uh, we made a big social campaign. Um, so we used uh, Facebook and Instagram to get people involved uh, on our project, on our expedition, and on the territories we were crossing. And uh, on the other hand, taking inspiration uh, uh, by the Forrest Gump movie, if you remember it, we publicly invited people uh, from anywhere uh, to walk with us. And in these uh, last three years, we had thousands and thousands of hikers with us along the trail. And that was very powerful, as it proved that there is a strong demand for lost tourists. So the time is ripe, let's say. Uh, now, it's pretty, obviously, it's pretty uh, impossible to summarize uh, a three years trip in this uh, few minutes. So uh, I won't even try. Uh, I just rather make a couple of considerations, uh, which I hope could be useful uh, in this debate. Uh, so slow tourism, in our experience, uh, represents a big opportunity for areas uh, of our country, but not just that, which are pretty depopulated, uh, where people uh, consider themselves as an outskirt of the country. So it, maybe it does not create the same uh, economical flow than other types of tourism do, uh, still sustainable, uh, but it helps to protect places that despite their beauty, their massive cultural tradition are still pretty unknown. So we can say that slow tourism is a, is a way to economically sustain these places, getting a lot of people involved and preserve that incredible beauty which uh, otherwise uh, we risk to lose. And that's the definition of a sustainable tourism, isn't it? Uh, 
in order to do that, uh, what I think uh, we all need to do is invest on uh, interaction, which is a kind of uh, the main ingredient of our project. So interaction uh, with the public, of course, in order to promote territories, to make them attractive to potential tourists, creating awareness of those places. And on the other hand, to invest on in interaction with the local communities. Um, along our journey, many times, uh, we had the feeling that uh, interventions, so let's say government interventions to, re to resurrect inland areas, uh, were pretty failing because they came down from above without considering the local communities and their specific needs. And uh, tourism cannot be sustainable if local communities are not uh, involved. Uh, and uh, finishing my intervention, I think that you won't find anyone easier to involve than young people. Uh, young people are willing to prove their ideas, uh, willing to find uh, alternative ways of sustainability, uh, starting from tourism and preserving nature by leaving it. So uh, it's true that you can count on young people. At the same time, it's also true that uh, you have to count on young uh, people. And uh, I think that the fact that we were, we are young in our project was the, maybe the, the main key of our uh, success. Um, by saying goodbye, I like to share a video we created uh, about the last year of our ex expedition and i hope it could uh, inspire you all so thank everybody and uh, good luck per Itaca, devi augurarti che la strada sia lunga, fertile in avventure e in esperienze. Gli strigoni e i ciclopi o la furia di Nettuno non temere non sarà questo il genere di incontri. Se il pensiero resta alto è un sentimento fermo guida il tuo spirito e il tuo corpo. In ciclopi e gli strigoni no certo, né nell'irato Nettuno incapperai. Se non li porti dentro, se l'anima non te li mette contro. Devi augurarti che la strada sia lunga, che i mattini d'estate siano tanti, quando nei porti, finalmente e con che gioia, toccherai terra tu per la prima volta. Negli empori fenici in Dugia, e a questa madre perle, coralli, ebano e ambre, tutta merce fina, anche profumi penetranti d'ogni sorta, più profumi inebrianti che puoi. Va in molte città egizie. Impara una quantità di cose dai dotti. Sempre devi avere in mente Itaca. Raggiungerla sia il pensiero costante. Soprattutto non affrettare il viaggio. Fa che duri a lungo, per anni. E che da vecchio metta piede sull'isola. Tu, ricco dei tesori accumulati per strada senza aspettarti ricchezze da Itaca. Itaca ti ha dato il bel viaggio. Senza di lei mai ti saresti messo sulla strada. Che cos'altro ti aspetti? E se la trovi povera, non per questo Itaca ti avrà deluso. Fatto ormai savio, con tutta la tua esperienza addosso, già tu avrai capito ciò che Itaca vuole significare.
wonderful images of Italy. I would like to thank all the participants and the guests of our of our last panel, all panels for being here. And I now give the floor to to Lorenzo for a very special final of this of this wonderful afternoon together. Thank you. I would like to say thanks to Georgia. Thanks, Georgia. We are really uh, close to the end uh, of this journey, but before uh, concluding um, this meeting, this forum today, let me briefly introduce uh, um, a great Italian guest today, uh, just to conclude the event of uh, uh, today. Uh, and uh, we will use again a video to introduce the connection that we made, a lot of connection that we made from Italy to Dubai, from Dubai to Italy. And we want to make this jump with a TV presenter, a cyclist, uh, I would say trial sanction. Uh, he has entered the Guinness World Record 10 times, thanks to his remarkable uh, sporting achievement. He recently moved to Dubai to shoot a fascinating video and I want to introduce him to this picture to see again a new connection from Italy to Dubai, from Dubai to Italy. Thank you. Make this jump, Vittorio Brumotti is with us. Please, please. Salam alaikum, ciao. Good morning, good night. I'm Vittorio Brumotti. Okay, ciao. Ecco, facciamo un salto, we make this jump uh, and we switch uh, from English to the Italian and we're ready to start this ending journey, endless journey. La bicicletta, abbiamo qui ospitato anche le bici del Giro d'Italia, ma qui parliamo di Italia, parliamo di Emirati, eh, il tuo arrivo qui a Dubai, lo abbiamo visto, introdotto con queste immagini, conoscevi bene ovviamente l'ambiente, la città, il, questo, questo luogo, questo, questo paese, il tuo primo impatto con la città di Dubai. Ok, I'm 100% Brumotti, ok, 100% Brumotti. 50% Dubai, 50% italiano. Eh, arrivo in questo splendido paese, eh, fatto di tanti amici, tanti fratelli, e, e nel 2012 scalo la Burj Khalifa, la torre più alta al mondo, e eh, stabilisco il mio ottavo Guinness World Record. Dopodiché poi mi ha portato bene, ne abbiamo stabiliti 10. Eh, I fratelli di Dubai mi hanno aperto le porte della, di questa città incredibile, la città dei record, e allora hanno detto ci prendiamo il brumo, il brumo ti fa avanti e indietro, tanto sono solo sei ore di, di aereo, e questo è il mio, mio, mio parco giochi, dove mi diverto, mi posso allenare tutto l'anno, e, e racconto della mia bella Italia, la mia bella Italia perché io sono modestamente l'ambassador del FAI, Fondo Ambiente Italiano, e racconto del paese più bello del mondo, come vi dico, e, e ogni anno parto dal nord Italia e vado fin giù al tacco e sulle isole a, eh, con la mia bicicletta per circa 3.000 km eh, eh, faccio vedere agli italiani, a, a tutte le persone che amano l'Italia eh, queste rare bellezze che non, non sono sempre 
palesate, non le puoi vedere sempre, non è solo il Colosseo, non è la Torre di Pisa, non è Venezia, magari è ehm, un giardinetto che è stato recuperato, mi viene in mente il giardino della Colimbetra ad Agrigento, dove vi erano lavatrici, dove vi erano eh, bruttezze, brutto e tutto, e grazie all'impegno dei volontari è stato recuperato e adesso c'è l'arancio malfatto, pensa la scorza dell'arancio è reagita, è diventato un arancio bruttissimo ma dolcissimo e buonissimo, dunque un, un sacco di storie da raccontare, ma come vi dicevo che sono 50% in Italia e 50% qua, ho deciso di fare anche un tour negli Emirati, qua abbiamo Matera, poi abbiamo i trulli, poi abbiamo un citrullo, eccolo qui, <ride> sempre con la mia bicicletta. Mi piace raccontare e mo tutti quanti voi eh, pensate all'ecosostenibilità. Io sono ecosostenibile da sempre e viva la bicicletta, è un po' il mio momento e sono veramente felice perché la bicicletta è il primo mezzo per tagliare il cordone ombellicone, come dicono i bambini, e riuscire a fuggire da, dai genitori e perdersi. E oggi è stata ritrovata, e eh, guardate, mi viene la pelle d'oca, eh, ho fatto tante belle pedalate e ve lo consiglio. So che c'è anche il nostro ministro qua del turismo lo saluto eh, che, e so anche caro ministro che tu pedali eh, con le bike eh, dunque abbiamo un ministro a pedali e viva eh. e, e anche qui abbiamo tanti amici che, che, che pedalano anche al maktoum se potete vedere eh, rashid al maktoum che pedala con la bicicletta in giro per la città abbiamo mister seide rebo mio carissimo amico che è l'equivalente del nostro ministro de, del turismo e tutti in bicicletta. È stato fatto un piano per oltre 500 km di piste intorno a questa bellissima città dove si può praticare, fare il biking per circa 8 mesi l'anno, non è poco. E, um, un bel gemellaggio tra queste due bellissime realtà e tantissimi amici arabi che visitano l'Italia e che mi chiamano, e, e sono il Cicerone e degli amici di Dubai, mi dicono Brumo, voglio andare a fare lo Stelvio. E dico, occhio che qua è tutto piano, eh. Sullo Stelvio tiriamo su, eh? una bella dieta, una bella magnata, eh? e, e viva, che dire, viva la bicicletta, e viva il FAI, e viva l'Italia, e viva Dubai. Vi faccio vedere una cosa, dato che sono tutto tatuato, magari vi spaventate, guardate qua, eh. gli amici arabi ci tengono. Abbiamo ho tatuato la Burj Khalifa e tutto lo skyline di Dubai, dunque ho oh, Dubai sempre con me. <ride> Grazie allora, vi ringrazio e viva! <ride> Ciao. Grazie, grazie Vittorio, grazie per questa testimonianza, questa connessione tra l'Italia e gli Emirati Arabi Uniti, il progetto FAI, i luoghi del cuore, eh, grazie a Intesa eh, San Paolo, grazie perché abbiamo costruito questo ponte ma è che è un ponte che alimentiamo dal primo di ottobre e continueremo a farlo fino alla fine eh, di Expo e questo forse era il modo migliore anche per eh, chiudere l'incontro di oggi e non smettere mai di costruire eh, questi ponti. Abbiamo parlato di turismo, di mobilità, lo abbiamo fatto con un oggetto e qui soprattutto con una persona, ambasciatore della bici nel mondo lo facciamo però guardando i paesaggi tanti italiani qui rappresentati e lo facciamo sempre all'interno segna di un principio che ricalchiamo e che qui è il padiglione delle competenze che lo ricalca, quello della sostenibilità, quello di un'integrazione tra uomo e natura per il nostro futuro, per tutti eh, i giovani e quindi viva l'Italia, viva gli Emirati Arabi Uniti e diamo e ringraziamo soprattutto tutti per essere stati qui eh, con noi. Grazie.